Hello, everyone. My guest today is Florian Leibert. He's the co-founder at Mesosphere, the hybrid cloud platform company, which helps companies like NBC Universal, Deutsche Telekom, and Royal Caribbean adopt transformative technologies like machine learning and real-time analytics with ease. Florian, you ready to take us to the top? Yes, for sure. All right. So um, I'm sure you've done this before. Try and simplify this idea for us. Help us understand what you guys do and what the revenue model is. Are you pure place ass? No, we're not a pure play SaaS company. So um, I'll give you a quick background. So we started the company because uh, I used to work with my co-founders at Twitter and Airbnb, and we helped both of these companies actually uh, build the next generation infrastructure that helped the company scale. And we took a lot of those learnings and figured that we want to bring that same sort of technology to any company out there, not just the top engineering companies out there, but really any company. And the companies you mentioned, Royal Caribbean and so forth, they are all customers that are now employing our technology to actually build modern products. Mm -hmm. And so how do they pay you though? Is it a licensing model, a SaaS model or something else? It's a subscription-based pricing, but um, most of our customers run, even if they run us in the cloud, um, they still pay us a, per, a, a, a subscription license for okay. support and for the proprietary version. Yeah, so, you, I mean, you are a SaaS-based business then. Yeah, I mean, but it's not self-serve. It's not SaaS and it's not just the, uh, hey, swipe your credit card and and you're ready to go. Oh, no, no, uh, I, I, don't mean self, yes. I don't mean self-serve. No, no, I mean, I've had a lot of CEOs doing, uh, you know, between 100 and $400 million in ARR. They're all selling enterprise. They're all pure SaaS, um, and they're, but yes. they're definitely not swiping credit cards on an online portal. Yeah, to- <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right. Okay, good. So that's helpful to understand. So um, give me a general sense of, of kind of sweet spot for you then, right? What are companies paying on average per year to use this technology you've built? So um, our average pricing really varies depending on how big the customer's footprint is in the data center on the cloud. Um, By the number of physical servers or by the number of virtual machines if they're actually using our software in the cloud. Okay, interesting. So you upsell based off number of physical servers or virtual machines. Do you do any seat-based or feature-based upselling? So um, a product that we're actually launching pretty soon is going to be seat-based. It's going to be actually a mixed model between both nodes and seats. and I can, unfortunately can't go into details about what that product is, but yes, we definitely have that. Um, okay, so yeah. so no, but today you're only upselling today. based off number of virtual machines, number of physical servers, nothing based off number of seats or number of nodes. Well, nodes is basically the number of nodes is basically the number of uh, physical servers or virtual machines. We have some customers that have very special hardware, and uh, for them, we've done pricing based on a core basis. Okay, I so want to ca- I want to capture I want to capture more of kind of the founding story here, how you realized this was a problem, you know, at your Twitter and Airbnb yeah. days. Before we do that, though, this is going to be painful for you, but we don't we can't talk about every customer cohort. What would you say a, a sweet spot is for you, like a hundred thousand dollar years or a million a year or ten million a year? What's a sweet spot? Uh, the sweet spot is a couple of hundred thousand a year. Okay, you feel like that's fair. And and let's just role play for a second. If someone's signing up, average customer, $200,000 per year, how many virtual machines might they have? I mean, uh, that, it it really depends. We have a number of ways of packaging our product, but I'll I'll give you I'll give you an example. So generally, customers start with like an accelerator package, which can start anywhere from fifty thousand to a hundred thousand dollars or so, and then oftentimes uh, they get a lot of value out of the software and uh, embed our technology into more and more of their products because it really helps them develop their products faster. And that's how we expand. So it's really a land and expand strategy that our business is based on. Okay. But generally speaking, it sounds like almost all customers spending now more than more, more than hundred grand a year. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Pretty much everybody starts somewhere. And then as the application footprint grows, the needs uh, to use more of our software subscriptions grows. And that's how we grow our footprint. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Let's put this on a timeline. What year did you launch the company? Um, we launched the company in 2013. So in, I think it was March 2013. 2013. And you've chosen to raise capital. I'll tell everyone how much you've raised and then articulate kind of why, why you had to raise. Why did you have to take the dilution? Yeah, so we raised a total of $252 million, uh, in funding. Um, and uh, the, the reason is uh, simple. We're building something that's very, very complicated, right? I mean, we are basically... Uh, it, we're basically taking a number of open source technologies and uh, also work with some proprietary software vendors. And we're we're basically automating all of these software components um, to let our customers focus on what they're best at. And that is usually building their products. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, 
that requires if you're dealing with all of these software components and the complexity um, that these run on different versions of uh, operating systems, like different versions of Linux, different flavors of Linux. Um, it's very, very complex. We have to create a lot of software that automates um, these components. Think, for example, on a cruise ship. We mentioned Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines. They use our software on the cruise, cruise ships in order to power their um, mobile app and some other analytics that they're running. And on the cruise ship, you don't necessarily have software engineers right on board that can that can actually fix something if a server, for example, has an outage. So our software has to actually self-heal. And uh, building that is actually very, very complex. We have a lot of really talented engineers who come from the likes of Twitter, Airbnb. How many Google folks total are on the team? We have around 390 people right now. And how many are engineers? I would say we have about 110, 120 engineers. Okay, fair, fairly a fairly healthy engineering team there. Okay, yeah. so take me back here. So 2013 was when the first line of code was written? Well, I mean, really the first line of code um, that went into our technology was written well before then. It was written um, when uh, my co-founder Ben Hinton was doing his PhD thesis at, U uh, at UC Berkeley. He was working on a uh, on a piece of software that really automates the data center. And that software was the first product that we or the, f the first open source project that we productized. And um, uh, later on, of course, many other technologies came into the mix. But uh, really, the first line of code was probably written in 2008. OK, 2008. And then I guess the reason I ask is I'm always curious how much money a company will sink into their building their MVP before they, you know, they ask for their first dollar of revenue. Yeah. So how much I imagine it's probably a hefty amount. How much did you guys put into the MVP before you got your first dollar? So, so I mean, <laughs> The interesting thing is if you if you look at uh, Twitter and Airbnb, for example, as actually contributing to this open source software project um, that we were based upon, I mean, I think you can say hundreds of millions. I mean, uh, there were large engineering teams at both of these companies that were actually uh, creating this open source software. So hundreds of millions even before the uh, MVP was was uh, written in Mesosphere. If you just look at again, literally dollars out of your bank account that you had to pay essentially engineers to kind of get this thing going before the first dollar of revenue, what would that actual amount be? Do you know? Uh, I mean, let's, let's say we had the first product, we had the first product that we built from this open source project. And that was pro that probably cost us like, I'd say a million dollars, the first MVP that we built ever as Mesosphere. Yeah. I'd say it was probably, it, it was probably three quarters of a year and half of our seed round. And our seed round was about, um, 2.2 million. So, 2.2. So, okay. And yeah. did you raise that seed round right in 2013, right at the start? Yes, exactly. We raised that right away and, um, we wanted, we, we, yeah, wanted to really get to know. Our and investors. was that really, was that really based off the credibility of your background plus your partner's PhD project? Yeah, exactly. And the and the community that was actually behind the project. Yeah. So how do you look? We had we had the the automatic folks on, obviously, great story there. And I always ask these folks that launch company on top of an open source platform how they managed literally PR, right? So when you go into open source community and then you're essentially going to profit on top of an open source platform that other people contributed to, it's a hard thing to balance, right? So how did you make sure you didn't piss a lot of people off by essentially productizing something that was open source that everyone got value from free? Yeah, that was indeed um, our concern initially as well. So one of the one of the things that we continue to do is to actually contribute, continue to contribute to the open source project, right? Basically, spending company resources on making sure that the free free users of the software can continue to to use it. And um, we never try to hold back any any major features or anything like that. What we try to do is we try to provide provide additional value that. Uh, the customers that were not naturally um, self adopters and and early early adopters of of, of technology um, would use and find useful and uh, yeah trying to just make complicated things much easier for less sophisticated customers right and we figured that we probably will never get Twitter to be a customer because they just had such a large engineering uh, team already that they could build most of these. Uh, or, or could, could actually implement most of what they needed on their own. So today, how many lines of code are you contributing monthly to the open source project for free? I don't know. I, I really don't have those stats. Do you measure I mean, that stuff? Um, I think the engineering team certainly measures their code contributions, but the, the complexity is that we actually contribute across a wide uh, breadth of projects, right? Not I just see. a single a singular project, but really like a, a probably on the order of 20 to 30 open source projects where we actively contribute fixed bugs and so forth. I see. So that's your way of staying in the good graces of the open source community, why you build a big business on top of it. 
We, we hope to do so. Yes. Yeah. That's, I think that's probably a smart move. <laughs> you don't want well, that community revolting on you. <laughs> yeah. But, and, and I think it also helps us, right? Because I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's not just, it's a little self-serving as well, because of course we, um, we don't have to maintain necessarily a different code path and then have a lot of complicated logic, uh, to, to reconciliate those two different projects. So what we try to do is we just, we, at least in, in theory, I don't know if, if it's in practice all the time like this, but we try to put, think of plugins, like that's kind of like what we're trying to do, like value add things on top that leave uh, the existing code base uh, as, as it is. Yeah, no, that's smart. Okay. So you're doing all this to scale. Um, you launched on top of that open source platform. How many customers are you now serving today? So we have about 130, 140 customers. Okay, fair enough. Now, 130 customers, um, uh, take me back to kind of your team today, right? So do you have an inside sales team? I know you probably don't like talking about yeah. sales because you're an engineer, but do you have an inside sales motion? Um, I had to, I had to actually get, to, I used to talk a lot about sales. I mean, I was until January, um, I, I had the role of the CEO until we hired Mike Fay, who was just a phenomenal guy, uh, who came out of Symantec. He was the president CEO of Symantec and, uh, the CMO of Symantec afterwards also joined. So ph phenomenal. Um, but sales, yeah, of course we, we have an, we have an account development uh, rep team or sales development rep team. Um, so they basically find, find, uh, our leads and convert them into, into good prospects and, and, uh, or, um, and, uh, oh, sorry, they could, they convert the leads and, um, they go to, we have a community team that goes to trade shows. We also have the sales reps that attend trade shows and conferences to collect leads. And, um, so, uh, yeah, so basically, and initially, of course, what we had was customers calling us because we were the only company at the time that was servicing um, the software, the open source software. So companies initially called us when they had problems. But um, as, as we grew and as, of course, there was more competition, we had to have an outbound sales team as well. Yeah. So, I mean, do you know how aggressive that team or you as a company are being in terms of if you see a company is going to be worth $250,000 to you in terms of their year one contract? Will yeah. you spend that full amount up front to get the customer? Are you happy with a 12 month payback? I mean, I don't, look, I think, I think like we, we don't really look at it that way right now. Um, we are really in, in, uh, in growth mode. I mean, I, I think it's not, this isn't, we're not like a super traditional business where you can, uh, where you can say, where you can exactly attribute how much it costs to, to win that customer, right? There's, there's a certain amount of overhead. I already mentioned the community team uh, it's hard to measure like the exact impact because you're building up goodwill right um if you're well, but, but, but to be fair though florian i mean you're uh i mean your partner's phd you're an engineer which means you understand i mean your metrics you're a rule kind of based guy there are ways to calculate cac some people take all their company expenses every month divided by new customers sometimes it's just sales and marketing sometimes it's just paid spend i mean there are ways to measure I, this i mean you can slice and dice this in, in many different ways of course i mean uh i think i think we we don't want to i think right now there's there's the, the cac is probably lower than than the full 12 months. I mean, I'm, I'm sure about that. I don't know the exact number here and I, I don't, I don't know that we've shared this before, yeah. um, but, but, uh, it's certainly less than 12 months. Yeah. And, and I mean, so do, do you, the reason I asked that is because many people would argue whoever wins a space, right. Comes in the number one or number two spot is actually the company that builds the healthiest economics because then they can pay the most to get the customer. Right. So, so that's the reason I ask it, how aggressive you're willing to be on CAC. I mean, like, I, th I think we're a venture backed startup. So by the nature of it, I think we're pretty aggressive, right? We, we, but I I'd argue actually six months is not aggressive at all. Most venture backed startups that have raised between a hundred and 500 million bucks in, in revenue. I mean, you see payback periods in like 18, 24 month kind of timeframes. Yeah. I mean, uh, again, I think, I think it depends on how it depends on what you, what you add to the, to your cost basis, right. For, for, uh, I think like it's probably longer if you add all of the community in and we don't really do that because it's, it's a little harder to, to attribute the leads that come into the community bucket. Uh, well, and there's no the, cash to, outlay for that for you today, really direct. For the community team. Correct. Right. Well, I mean, like besides salaries. Is, well, yeah, but I mean, those are pretty substantial, right? Yeah. yeah. You're talking about engineering salaries that are contributing back code to these projects that giving, bring you leads. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Okay. Let's move on from that. Um, it sounds like you have a pretty healthy expansion module where the cruise line installs you on one fleet and they love you so much the next year they triple their account and they install you on the European fleet, et cetera. Do, do you know, if you look at the past 12 months, kind of what kind of a gross revenue churn is relative to expansion on that same cohort? 
Yeah, so 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 we of course know that, and we measure that, but that's unfortunately a metric I can't share. Um, that's okay. I guess what I'm asking is, I think most companies um, at scale, world class net revenue retention would be something like 140. percent Have you hit that yet today? We've hit we've hit that before, yes. Okay, okay, but you're not there today. Um, I I think I, I I don't have the number in my head right now. I mean, like for us, for us, like quarterly sales uh, in the enterprise business, right, are a little uh, lumpy. So sometimes a, a quarter. I mean, Q1 always looks different than Q2, Q3, and Q4, right? So, um, so I think, uh, yeah, I mean, like there's some fluctuation depending on what time in the year you look at it. And I don't, I can't share the number for last year. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. That's fine. Um, la- uh, next question here, uh, folks at your scale, when you're going out and do a, doing a capital raise, how do you think about how much you want to raise for in terms of how much runway you want to buy yourself? Do you raise for 12 months, 18, 24 months? What's your theory? No, we, we've, um, we've always tried to raise for 36 months. Really? Okay. That's, that's, yeah. I've never heard the number that high before. Why 36 months? Well, because, um, because I think like if, if you look at, at our business, it's first of all, I mentioned this very capital intense, the, the, um, the amount of time it takes to close these deals, the ramp uh, is, is pretty long. The ramp for, for the sales force is really long because it's a very complex product. And we wanted to always have, uh, have uh, basically the room uh, room for error or room for a changing ecosystem right because we we are in a spot where uh, in some in some ways if google comes out with a new technology which they did 3 years ago we really have to we really have to change gears and uh, and double down on this new technology it's a, and, and uh, that that plus um uh, plus wanting to have uh, the additional resources in case in case an opportunity comes up always made us uh, want to to have 36 months of re- of cash that last raise was back in may of 2018 125 yeah. million bucks if we divide that by 36 months that would mean at that point maybe you were burning between 3 and 4 million a month are you still being that aggressive are you still burning that amount per month Unfortunately, I don't. I really can't talk about the the burn number, but um, uh, I think we have we have uh, we have a lot of head headroom in order to to um, grow as a business. Yeah. Well, for him, by the way, I don't want to put numbers in your mouth. Those are numbers you gave me. You said you raised for thirty six months, and your last raise was one twenty five, which would mean burn would be about between three and five million a month. Yeah, but I mean that. I mean that's that's kind of like the. I, I think that's the that's the average case. I think that obviously you want to be you want to have it last even longer if possible by being more profitable or by not profitable but but by burning less over time, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, unless you're in a kind of winner take all space, that's highly intensive. Uh, being profitable at your board meeting would actually be a massive weakness because they'd go, "Oh my gosh, Florian doesn't know where to invest anymore." I mean, I think it's all. I think I think businesses that are run as profitable businesses are always are always the best businesses, right? But I mean, um, for let me put it this way: I would be shocked if your company, with your funding history, was going to tell a story at a board meeting or pre-IPO saying we're looking at being profitable right now. With how much you've raised, I just I think that like is a story that's not a story you're going to tell. Well, no, I mean that's. <laughs> But I'm, I'm just saying, I mean, aspirationally, of course, you of don't course, want to... <laughs> <laughs> we, all, we all want to be one, like, you know, profitability, you know, 60 percent of the bottom line every month, of course. Yes, exactly. OK, fair enough. Um, what's next on the roadmap? Again, that last raise was a little over a year ago. Are you raising yep. now again or prepping for an IPO? What's the next move? No. So, I mean, obviously, we brought in uh, Mike and the team because we wanted to to, uh, to um, set the company up for an potentially an IPO or um or a, a really like high growth future and um, really like shift the company around from being super, um, well, be an open source only company or to, to perceive as kind of an open source company to being a real enterprise company, right? Um, we want to be the folks that come in and help uh, other, uh, help our customers bring really complicated software and turn their products into production products, right? Not not just and 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 Mike has a background of doing that. When he when he and his team came into Blue Code, they actually um, they actually quadrupled, I think, the company valuation within two and a half three years. Um, and then they were um, acquired by Semantic, and they did a phenomenal job there um, before before leaving here. So um, obviously, we just did this shift about six months ago where we brought in that team. I'm super excited about that. And um, in about a month or so, uh, we have some really exciting product news as well. Yep. Uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to share them right now because I'd be taking it stealing the thunder, basically. No, that's OK. But, but Florian, I mean, uh, you bring it, you bring in great talent. You have a big product release. It's a great storyline leading up to an S1 filing. And if you did decide that IPO was the right move for you, I mean, could you see that happening the next call at two to five quarters? Two to five is a pretty broad spectrum. I mean, that's eighteen I, I, months. I'd, 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 I'd say definitely not within the next. Uh, definitely not within the next. Uh, yeah, I think definitely not within the next year. 
Okay. And why is that? Do you feel like you have to hit like, you know, some revenue target before you actually, actually file or why not definitely in the next 12 months? I mean, I, I, I just, I just know that the, uh, that we're just launching this product. And I already mentioned that the ramp period for reps is, is pretty high, right? Like in complex software, it takes about nine to you know, sometimes even longer than nine months to um, nine months to ramp uh, a sales rep. So uh, I think we really want to see the value of these awesome products that we're bringing out. And so, so it'll be a while until yeah. we see the, the aggressive growth of that. And I think that's, that's uh, once, once we have those nailed and once we have, um, uh, all the reps uh, that uh, basically be fluent with that new set of products, then I think we we can have that conversation again. That's great. With the new product launch and some of the other changes you're making, I mean, does it does it feel reasonable or or uncomfortable to have you know you know to hit 100 million bucks in AR run rate next year? Uh, I think I think it's possible. Yeah, but but a little uncomfortable. Um, I mean. Uh, I, I, there's always, there's the possibility. I mean, I think, well, you never I, want a safe goal. Safe goals are boring. I'm just curious. Is that, is that goal make you <laughs> nervous or no, you guys feel pretty darn good about hitting it. So I think we brought in a really amazing executive team, right. To, um, to take us to the next, uh, to take us to the next level. And I think anything is possible with this team. That's great. All right. Um, last set of questions here. You mentioned 140 customers. It sounds like everyone is North of hundred grand, maybe even more than that. Call it 250 a year in terms of ACVs. That would put you North of 3 million bucks a month right now in revenue, potentially way North of that. Is that accurate? It's north of that. For That's sure. great. And then if you go back a year ago today, I mean, was annual growth rate year over year in the kind of 30, 40% range or higher? Uh, again, like those those numbers, we haven't shared publicly yet. What so do you target? We I haven't shared our goals around around exact numbers. Okay, publicly. I mean, would you fair if we don't talk about you for a second? You know, most companies this kind of stage, you're doing three x three x two 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 x basically to IPO. I mean, is it fair to say that kind of two x benchmark industry average is what you're also targeting? I think, I think, yes, definitely with new, new product revenue, that's always the goal, right? Like at least two X. Yeah. All right. Very good. Let's wrap up with the famous five. Number one, what's your favorite business book? Um, favorite business book is probably, um, um, uh, probably, well, it's not a book. Well, Crossing the Chasm. And uh, that's a book, obviously, by Jeffrey Moore. That's amazing. Yeah, it's a good um, one. But I think there's a really cool research paper, actually. Um, I forgot which which business school it came out of, but it's called The Sales Lear- Learning Curve. Um, that was one of the, one of the um, by, by Mark Leslie. And uh, I think that's a really, really great um, paper to read for anyone who's thinking about um, sales and sales great. operations. Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying? Well, I'm learning a ton from Mike Fay now, who's who's our CEO here at Mesosphere. Number three, what's your favorite online tool built to build your company? Uh, G Suite. <laughs> All right, number four, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? Uh, I try to get I try to get no more. I try to get like six and a half, seven hours of sleep. And what's your uh, how old are you? Uh, thirty six. Thirty six. And situation: married, single, kids. Um, married with a kid on the way. Oh, oh, congratulations. That's exciting. Thank you. All yeah. right. Uh, last question. What do you wish your 20 year old self knew? Um, um, I think, I think, I mean, back then I was still, uh, living for the most part in Germany. Right. And so, um, I think I would have told myself, Hey, uh, come to the States sooner, come to Silicon Valley sooner. Guys move to the States sooner. Uh, Mesosphere helping over 140 enterprise customers paying call at 100, 200 North of that uh, grand in terms of ACV first year ACV, helping them really get technology that, uh, Florian helped build inside of these other engineering giants like Twitter and Airbnb back in the day, along with the PhD research his partner was doing again, scaling nicely now launched in 2013, spent called a couple million on the MVP on top of an open source community. Uh, now $252 million raised, 390 folks on their team, hoping to hit $100 million in terms of run rate next year, but no IPO in the next 12 months. More focused on the next product release, the new CEO, the new leadership team and scaling from there. Florian, thank you for taking us to the top. Thank you so much.